I'm uh, Commander Joaquin Pacheco Santos uh, from the Portuguese Navy, and I'm here at the Africa Center. Been here for three years um, as Portuguese national representative with the Africa Center, and I'm here with great pride. I'll be the moderator for this plenary session. And as you can, as you might guess, as a naval officer, it's a great pleasure to moderate this session, which is, would be subject of which is very familiar to me. For me, it's a great honor, a great privilege to be able to moderate this session on a theme that's very familiar to me, which is the, the threats to maritime security on the African continent. And let me give a brief inter introduction because we wanna hear our brilliant speakers, of course. The sea and the oceans cover about three quarters of the, uh, of the planet, the surface of the planet. The oceans play a fundamental role in the life of the planet because they regulate the climate and they're the means of uh, communication for the transport of goods. As we know, about 80% of the world commerce is conducted through uh, our waterways in Africa. It's 90%. And this also occurs through sea travel, among other um, modes of transportation. We're going to find uh, sea, we're going to find fisheries, um, hydrocarbons, uh, naval transport, and naval construction, which happens at sea. We believe that the oceans constitute one of the last frontiers to be explored, whether it be in terms of mineral resources or for food production and energy. The great majority of the world population lives near the sea. However, it's for the majority of people, the sea ends about 12 miles from the coast. Why? Because in on days of good visibility with good conditions, it's 12 miles out that you can see. And the sea for many of us ends that ends 12 miles out. The sea has been evermore the um, place for competition between diverse actors. And this has been played out in piracy, illegal fishing in many parts of the globe that has affected uh, maritime transport, and that's been causing great disruptions in the flow of uh, traffic throughout the world, maritime traffic. And there have been other particular situations that we're living today and that we see, for example, in areas where cereals are produced and has been causing great problems that pose enormous problems on in the lives of many countries and they demonstrate the importance of having a free seas and secure seas for the use of the international community. On the other hand, and the sea constitutes a biodiversity reservoir that's fundamental to the planet, but we know that the sea is at the mercy of many threats, environmental threats, that we see most evident in Africa. The liberty and security of the sea is fundamental for the development of the African continent. And that's why security or threats to security is of global imp importance, especially for the African continent, even for those countries that are landlocked and in the interior of the continent. The session today has three objectives, three fundamental objectives. First is to look at the trends, the security trends on the content, evaluate the uh, cooperation agreements for security on the continent, maritime security agreements, and the role of the security actors that seek to guarantee protections and maritime security. 
We have two distinguished guests, Dr. Yafinci Okafor, uh, Yar Professor Yarwood is professor of the University of St. Andrews, who's conducted much research in the area of um, environmental justice and human security. His work offers us a critical look at the concepts of development, the sustainable development with respect to um, marine resources, and especially in the areas of security, um, justice, and environment uh, and maritime governance, where he investigates um, environmental and, go and governments aspects of maritime resources in Africa. Dr. Kamal Dean is senior professor at the at professional and professional studies at the University of Accra and works as, as executive director of the uh, Maritime Center of Security. He's also uh, works at the Law Institute of Malta and to Interregional Maritime Safety Interest Institute in Abidjan. He combines, it blends uh, professional academic experience, which spans international law, international relations, ocean governance, defense, and security. He served for 20 years in the Ghana Armed Forces, during which he worked in multiple roles, both home and abroad. He is a consultant, technical expert, to a number of international institutions. He's also a fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations, Ghana, a senior research fellow at the Australian National Center for Ocean Resources and Security, and an associate at the Corbett Center for Maritime Policy Studies in the United Kingdom. He currently serves on the editorial boards of Journal of Defense, Security, and Strategy and the advisory board Strong High Seas Project. He holds a PhD from the University of Wollongong in Australia, and his other academic qualifications include Master of Law, Master of Arts in International Affairs, and Bachelor of Law. We will, I hope we have an, uh, an excellent session. Let me begin with Dr. Ifezanachi Yarwood. And I asked him to share with us his evaluation of security, of maritime security in Africa, and what are the drivers of the security situation and the aspects of this threat. And when you can, please share with us also on the basis of your vast experience, if you could share with us the aspects of the economic potential of the uh, blue economy in Africa in terms of governance of the communities of these regions. Please, your opinion with respect to what leaders of the region can do in terms of political leadership and institutional leadership reforms to be able to better control the maritime space and to anticipate threats to maritime security. I ask please, and I thank you beforehand for your excellent contribution. Thank you. And please use 15 minutes so that we can have time for questions and answers by this brilliant audience. You have the floor. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank, um, thank you, you so much. much. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, to answer your question, I'll try to, first of all, um, go through some of the importance of the maritime domain, then identify the threats, the factors contributing to threat to the threats, the economic cost, and then what um, policy changes or what the government on the continent can do differently. But first, I'd like to note that it is quite apt that today's session is holding on the World's um, Oceans Day, which I know is a coincidence, but it also highlights the importance of the maritime domain, not only for the African continent, but also global community. 
please may I ask that my slide be projected because I feel that it would be important for the conversation we're going to have um, throughout the 50 minutes that I have presently. So to begin, the Africa's maritime environment is enriched with minerals, aquatic resources, and, uh, and, uh, and other um, hydrocarbon resources that contribute to the food and economic security of millions of people on the continent. It contributes importantly to the food and economic security of the 38 coastal and small island nations on the continent, but also importantly to the 15 landlinked or landlocked countries on the continent. The maritime domain is also vital for the movement of goods and services are both for coastal and landlocked countries. All these together means that the, the continent's maritime environment and the resources that lay within it is attractive to both state and non-state actors. And unfortunately, because of this significance, it also exposes them to threats, including but not limited to oil and cargo theft, illicit trafficking and diversion of arms, drugs trafficking, human trafficking, illegal unreported and unregulated fishing and legal fishing, because of course it's not only illegal fishing that undermines the security of uh, coastal states and land linked countries on the continent. Um, piracy and robbery at sea, toxic waste dumping, and what I classify as emerging security threats such as maritime um, terrorism and cyber crime. It's important to note, of course, that whilst maritime terrorism is something that is not happening in this, at the same level as we see in, in, in landlocked areas on the continent, it is something that a lot of law enforcement in coastal states are very keen to look at, especially when we take into account that in 2016, we had a terrorist attack in Grand Bassam in, in Cote d'Ivoire. And cyber crime, of course, if you look at the recent um, cyber security threats that happened in the port of Durban in South Africa last year, you would see why law enforcement across coastal states on the continent are also looking at this actively as something that is worth noting. So the question then is, what are the drivers of, of some of these threats that I have highlighted? I think the most significant driver of the security threats that I've highlighted so far is the lack of effective institution. The fact that we do not have effective uh, maritime institution that is able to you know, harness the resources or manage the governance of maritime domain for the benefit of people that live in adjacent community, for the benefit of, of the sustainable development of both coastal states and their landlocked countries have meant that unfortunately other issues are arising. It, it has unfortunately resulted in the lack of rule of law. It has resulted in proliferation, if I can use that term, of corruption, uh, of poverty and deprivation in coastal communities because of course if if the institution are not as effective to manage the resources in their maritime domain it means that the people that are supposed to benefit from the extraction of these resources are not necessarily benefiting and with that you could see grievance and the way they respond to some of these grievance might be so extreme to the point that their action would undermine the security of the state. And whilst I'm saying this, I also want you to sort of have a look at the, the graphic on, on your right. You would see that we, we, to your left, first of all, we see what I classify as the, the blue economy sector, should I say, the, the opportunities that lie in the ocean environment on the African continent. And then you see a triangle to, uh, on the top, which should, if we look at the conceptual meaning of the blue economy, we, we sort of understand it to mean the sustainable exploitation of the ocean resources, wherein economic growth, social equity, and environmental conservation are prioritized together without prioritizing one over the other. And therefore, it means that in an ideal scenario, if, if the institution were to be effective, it means that 
the quest for economic growth would not undermine um, social well-being. As such, we're not likely to have poverty or deprivation in coastal communities or communities where resources are extracted. But in cases where we do not have this effective governance system, wherein the B sector, the sub, um, conceptual blue economy, conceptualizing of the blue economy is not taken into account, it means that a lot of the times economic growth would almost always be prioritized to the detriment of social well-being and environmental conservation, which, which is why, unfortunately, we have cases like the Niger Delta, you know, wherein exploration of oil in Nigeria, for example, have led to degradation and um, poverty and undermining the environment and, and livelihoods of the people. And with that have resulted in grievance and the response of the people to that grievance have been to, you know, take on to arms and, and the resulting security implication is manifested in, 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 in the form of militancy and in the extreme piracy and, and robbery at sea, which is why in recent times we've actually seen piracy and robbery at sea being a major issue in the Gulf of Guinea region, primarily originating from the Niger Delta area of Nigeria. Also as a driver, we have the lack of coordinated efforts in maritime law enforcement. The fact that we have an, an should I say, an ineffective um, maritime governance system or ineffective institution have meant that different agencies are working differently without necessarily you know, combining their efforts. For example, the Navy, are not necessarily aware of what the fisheries agency are doing and the fisheries agency are not aware of, the, of what the drugs law enforcement agency are doing despite the supposed interconnection between some of the threats or how they manifest on the continent. And so what are, the, are some of the economic costs of some of the threats I've highlighted so far? Although the question is asking me to focus on the economic cost, I think it is important to note that, unfortunately, the clandestine nature of the threat makes it impossible to actually ascertain the true cost of some of these um, issues or some of these threats that we've highlighted. Um, secondly, focusing on the economic implication alone would not really give us the full picture because sometimes the cost actually transcends money to directly undermining peace and security of not only coastal state, but also land link countries. But for the benefit of today's discussion, I'm going to focus on some of the economic costs of some of the threats. So for example, when we look at um, oil theft and sabotage, um, countries on the African continent lose billions of dollars each year to these threats, with Nigeria being one of the biggest losers. So for instance, in 2019, it was noted that Nigeria lost an estimated um, $2.8 billion to oil theft and sabotage, with a lot of the oil from, that is stolen from the country sold to countries like the United States, um, Brazil, Thailand, Indonesia, and countries in the Balkan. This is according to a research by Chatham House in 2013. The same research also noted that a lot of the proceeds from the oil are laundered in countries like the United States, Britain, Switzerland, and Dubai. These are countries that are seen as the preferred destination. Then we have piracy and Namrabria Sea. And something that is very interesting about piracy and Namrabria Sea is that although the proceeds from the ransom itself, especially take into account that um, the Gulf of Guinea region, which is countries in Western Central Africa, are identified currently as the hub, the global hub for piracy and Namrabria Sea. Something that is interesting about this is that the pirates themselves supposedly makes an estimated $5 million each year but countries in the region, including the amount that they spend in trying to you know, beef up their Navy and beef up their capacity to um, interdict and improve their security and safety of their waters, um, they, they are said to spend an estimated um, $2 billion each year, which of course is a lot of money, but it's not necessarily something that can be seen as a loss. As a loss, if you look at it that way, especially when you take into account the colonial history of a lot of these countries and the fact that for so long, their focus has been on issues relating to land threats. It's only more recently that they are focusing on issues relating to threats at sea. We also have, of course, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. And even though I'm going to focus on the economic cost, 
It's also important to note the potential food and income security implication, given that fish um, contributes to the livelihoods of millions of people on the African continent, primarily contributing to the food security of over two, 200 million people and employing more than 13 million people on the continent directly or indirectly. It therefore means that anything that undermines the sustainability of fish stock undermine directly the, the human security of those people that rely on fish trade. But in terms of economic costs, um, a recent re research by the African Development Bank noted that the continent loses an estimated $10 billion each year, and the multiplier effect exceeds um, $30 billion. This is more than 1% of the GDP of countries on the continent. An interesting thing about IU fishing or illegal unreported and unregulated fishing is also the link to fisheries crime, you know, wherein um, fishing vessels are used to engage in other, um, other um, tricks. So for example, fishing vessels in recent times have been implicated as being used for couriering um, um, drugs from Latin America. So for example, on the 22nd of May this year, um, as part of the French um, operation Curran Bay, in the Gulf of Guinea, they found a fishing vessel from Latin America with two tons of cocaine. On the 7th of April, authorities from Cabo Verde with the support of US agents also found a fishing vessel from Latin America, Brazil precisely with five tons of, uh, of cocaine. And so this tells you some of the link between maybe not IU fishing directly, but also legal fishing because it is probable that this vessel have legal rights to be in the area, but as part of their legal rights to, to fish in waters of, of the African continent, they are also able to bring in drugs, which is mostly bound for Europe. We also have illicit trade, and I'm highlighting this particular cost, not because it is significant, but just for, for us to highlight how for sometimes illicit maritime trade can also fund other activities or illicit activities on land. So for example, um, research found that charcoal, you know, the sale of charcoal, movement of charcoal from ports in Somalia up to the um, tone of 7.5 million, 7 million is the income is generated, generated by Al-Shabaab from, from the ports of Somalia, the sale of illicit sale of charcoal. So it tells you sometimes actually how maritime trade, illegal or illegal, can directly or indirectly, unless there is an effective system for monitoring what goes on, can undermine peace and security of countries on the African continent. The question then that I'd like to focus on is, based on the experience that I have so far, what is the economic potential of the blue economy on the African continent? And what I'd like to say, given that I've already highlighted the significance of the maritime environment and the resources of a continent to the food and economic security of its people, is to note that the different sectors of the blue economy, which is um, such as fisheries and aquaculture, maritime transport and shipping, tourism, blue power generation, and, and research and other sector, including um, offshore hydrocarbon exploration, for example, currently generate an estimated $1 trillion. It has the potential to generate even more. And the importance of the BE sector transcends the coastal states to also is very important for landlocked countries who rely on the maritime domain and the resources in their coastal states neighbor or in their neighboring countries for their own sustainable um, economic security. It therefore means that anything that undermines the sustainability of maritime resources or even the safety and, and security of the maritime domain, not only undermine the, the economic development of coastal states, but also directly that of landlocked countries, because it means that transportation of goods and services will be expensive for them. And so with that in mind, we could say that there are still so many opportunities for coastal and landlocked countries on the continent to harness the opportunity that lie in the maritime domain. So for example, taking advantage of the potentials in blue power generation, the use of tidal energy, for example, to generate electricity for the millions of people on the continent that currently do not have access to electricity. So we have countries like uh, South Africa, Mauritius and Cabo Verde taking advantage of some of this blue power generation. And so it tells you that there are still so many other countries that are yet to explore the opportunities that lie here. 
We also have the potential for coastal tourism, which remains significantly untapped compared to other countries. However, you could also say that unfortunately, uh, the lack of safety and security at sea might undermine um, efforts to invest or attract investors in coastal tourism, but there is a significant potential for the continent to harness the opportunity in the maritime domain, especially in relation to coastal uh, tourism, to create employment for millions of youth and also develop or ensure the sustainable development of coastal uh, states. We also have significant opportunities in maritime transport, especially when you take into account um, the African Free Trade Agreement coming into force. These are just examples of some of the sectors that have not necessarily been um, harnessed to the fullest. The, the shipping, maritime transport and shipping. There is also potential for offshore hydrocarbon exploration, of course, but all these things have to be taken into account the impact of climate change, given that increasingly uh, the way that oil is being explored and the implication it has on the sustainability of the environment is significantly a big problem for the continent, means that care needs to be taken. But the reality is that the opportunity that lies in the continent blue economy sector itself is endless. However, there are different factors that are contributing, or should I say limiting our ability to harness these opportunities. And I would um, highlight currently three main factors. One is infrastructure and technology. Two is finance. And three also relates to the first two that I've highlighted, which is um, capacity and lack of coherent policy. I'd like to read an excerpt from a paper, a research that I conducted with colleagues in 2020 that um, explored the opportunities, or should I say the development of the blue economy sector on the African continent, categorizing that, that development as either successful and or unsuccessful. And this excerpt more or less highlights why um, the blue economy sector unfortunately remains at, at the same level as as uh, at the same level as it was a few years ago. And we, note, we noted that the sustainable exploration of the ocean is undermined by inadequate knowledge and technological capacity on the continent, combined with limited investment in the BE sector. All this undermined for the development of the sector. With this in mind, it becomes clear that the African nations will not develop what, it do, it, what they do not understand. Therefore, blue growth becomes even more elusive and remains at the subsistent level of our ancestors. So in essence, if we do not actually understand what we have, we can't really know what we can explore. And unfortunately, the reality is that so many countries, coastal states on the continent do not even have research vessels to be able to you know, go to sea to explore the resources in their maritime domain to the point that even when they want to attract investors, it would be upon the investors to go and explore and then tell them what they have. And with that would have more capacity to actually negotiate in their own favor sometimes to the detriment of the African continent. So these are just some of the factors that is currently undermining our ability to harness fully the potentials of the blue economy. In concluding, and this is the last question I'd like to focus on, and I hope that there will be other opportunity for me to discuss further and maybe answer some of the questions that you might have. The last question that I, I, I was asked is to look at how African, African leaders and policymakers and institutions can harness the economic potential of maritime space. And what I can say in answering this question, especially if we look at the extensive nature of maritime security threat on the continent, is that it is very important for African policymakers, maritime enforcement agencies, and other stakeholders to take advantage of intelligence gathering. You know, they must not always be reactive. They, they must not only react when certain things have happened, but rather they can take advantage of the intelligence they gather and prevent incidents from happening. So we see a lot of this happening when it comes to threats like um, illicit, um, illicit drugs trafficking, for example, wherein intelligence gathering have led to successful interdiction and arrest of drugs traffickers. 
on the African continent. I've given the example from Cabo Verde in April. I've given the example of the Gulf of Guinea um, last month, and there are so many other examples. There are also examples of intelligence gathering leading to averting um, piracy incidents. And I think this is something that needs to happen more. But for this to be more successful, there is a need for cooperation and collaboration between agencies and the communities. And for this to also happen, there's a need for trust. And unfortunately, because of the fact that there is um, ineffective governance when it comes to management of the ocean's resources, there is not necessarily trust between communities and law enforcement. And this is undermining the effort or the ability to take advantage of the intelligence that might be gathered from communities. And so I think more needs to be done from the policy perspective to ensure that they take advantage of intelligence gathering in averting threats and not necessarily be more reactive. There's also need for the African government to recognize importantly that nobody will solve their problem for them. Yes, we live in a global community and there's a need for cooperation and collaboration with global and outside entities. But at the end of the day, the transboundary nature of the threat means that there is a need for them to collaborate more with their neighbors. There is a need for them to work collaboratively and there is a, a need to harmonize certain laws to ensure that, for example, that a criminal would not commit a crime in, crime, in, in country A where they know that there is a strong law on a particular threat and then escape to country B where they know that there is no law. So basically you commit a crime in country A and escape to another country where the law is insufficient you know, to be able to persecute you. And so there's a need for better cooperation and collaboration between coastal state on the continent and intersectoral cooperation and collaboration. Because at the end of the day, whilst we rely and we can count on the support of, of our international partners, at the end of the day, only countries on the continent can we on the continent can really solve their problem. And we just need to look as far as what happened at the beginning of COVID-19, where so many external partners were either withdrawing their navies or recalling their navies to be able to understand exactly what's happening, you know, with COVID in 2020. A lot of the operations were suspended, or Bangame, for example, did not happen in 2020 or was delayed. Uh, Operation Current Bay, for example, was delayed in 2020. And again, the, the current um, war between Russia and Ukraine have also shown us, you know, at the end of the day, countries would almost always um, prioritize their national interest. And, and, and as a result of that, countries on the African continent must, almost, must also recognize the importance for building collaborative effort as an entity internally first, and then they can count on, their external, on the support of their external actors rather than relying completely on their external actors without really doing much for themselves. Importantly, given unfortunately, the significance of maritime resources and the marine environment for um, the livelihoods of millions of people on the African continent. The reality is that the depletion of maritime resources and the lack of support from the state for the people to build resilience to their vulnerability is actually what is driving a lot of these people to to crime and this crime in effect undermine the peace and security of the continent itself. It is therefore important for governments of countries on the continent, especially coastal states to prioritize the needs of coastal communities, to prioritize the needs of fisher folk whenever they are making decision, especially when it relates to investment in different sectors of the blue economy, be it um, offshore your exploration or expansion of port infrastructure, they should ensure that the requisite compensation is made available for communities that are likely to be affected by such development. And they should also ensure that they engage with them at all times without necessarily um, without necessarily excluding them or seeing them as irrelevant. Most importantly, I would wanna conclude by noting that it is very important for countries on the African continent to reflect on some of the strategies they already have. Okay, currently we have the BE strategy by the African Union and so many other countries are either buying into some of the strategies and developing their own strategy. I think it is very important that they center the needs of their people when they are considering 
investment um, opportunities that is coming from external actors or even private sectors within the respective continent. They should not focus only on the quest for economic revenue today and undermine um, the food security and sustainable environment of the African future. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Efezinachi, for your brilliant um, intervention. And let's go to some fundamental questions now, namely the issues dealing with the blue economy that deal with hydrocarbons and maritime transport for the generation of electricity for fisheries, tourism, and that all of which generate jobs, many jobs, and that account for the standard of living for so many peoples. At the same time, uh, ideas emerge about sustainability, about climate, and the importance of these factors in the blue economy. So we find ourselves before um, uh, factors of great economic importance, but all of which are in risk because we have before us a great many threats for which we have to guarantee our security. These threats can be piracy, uh, illegal fishing, and environmental threats. As our presenter speaker said, we need infrastructures, technologies, and above all, financing to deal with these. And with respect to the African leaders, um, we need first and foremost uh, to avail ourselves of the strength of these economies. We have to prepare ourselves through a long process of uh, protecting these resources, which is the task of not one country, but all countries working together. Let's now turn to our second presenter, Dr. Kamal, to whom I would present the following questions. Uh, based on the maritime security that threatens Africa, please evaluate the level of responses to these threats at the national, regional, and continental level. Uh, please provide examples of these responses. Next, we would like to hear from your opinion as to which of these challenges, challenges face um, Please, and please provide examples of interventions, uh, successes and failures. And finally, um, what can leaders do in the security sector? What can they do in terms of leadership, policies, and institutional responses and uh, reforms in order to effectively face threats to security? I would ask, uh, again, that you abide by the 15 minute limit so that we can have time for questions and answers uh, of which I expect many. Uh, Dr. Kamal, the um, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, moderator, for the earlier kind introduction. And um, very grateful to Africa Center for Strategic Studies, but more importantly to the participants in the program that I'm having the opportunity um, to uh, contribute to this um, leadership seminar. Um, also importantly, um, I thank Ife, who has spoken earlier, um, laying out clearly um, the ocean governance nature of the African continent and the Gulf of Guinea. And more importantly, I've also indicated clearly uh, what threats we have from different angles. Uh, that has given me um, the seal um, with which I can move fast on my presentation. 
Um, Mr. Moderator, I'll be answering three of the questions that you have put to me, and I will do that um, um, from one to the other seamlessly. Um, I'll just transition from one to the other. Um, let me indicate that in terms of uh, what we need to do um, to address the threats that have been well laid out by IFE um, and the threats that the region and the continent is grappling with, uh, we need to do three things. And when I say we need to do three things, I mean we collectively need to do this at the national level, at the regional level, at the continental level, but also importantly with global contribution. And when we talk about national responses, we are not just talking about coastal states, but more importantly, we are also talking about landlocked states. Landlocked states may not be doing the same things that coastal states are doing, but their contribution to ocean governance is crucial because the maritime space generates benefits for both landlocked and coastal states. So in terms of how we view it and how we need to secure the oceans, um, it is a collective thing for all of us. So we need national responses first and foremost. We need regional responses and we need continental responses with global support where necessary. In terms of national responses, um, it is important that we do that looking at three, uh, looking at about four or five areas. One is capacity, the other is capability, which certain times we can say is a part of capacity. But also importantly, we need response mechanism as well as legal and institutional framework. These four or five areas, depending on how you conceptualize them, are key to addressing maritime security challenges or ocean governance challenges generally um, in the African continent. I want to speak to these national, um, if you want, uh, responses before I go to talk about the regional and the continental. When we talk about um, capacity and, and capability, here we are talking about both soft and hard uh, 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 architecture. Uh, we talk about soft and we talk about hard. In terms of hard, um, we are talking about physical infrastructure, for example. We are talking about platforms. Platforms are key because at the end of the day, just as um, uh, vehicles are needed by land enforcement officers on land, uh, when it comes to the maritime space, all maritime forces, be they Navy, Coast Guard, Marine Police, Customs, Immigration, all of them which may have some role to play, need some form of platforms. Uh, this may be shared platforms, this may be individual platforms, be it as it may, we need those platforms to be able to reach out at sea. And when we talk about the, um, the soft uh, uh, aspect of it, we talk about a significant thing like marine, uh, maritime domain awareness. You need information. So again, you use physical platforms such as um, sea vision, such as long range um, identification and tracking equipment, but at the end of the day, you need the information and the information can be seen as something that is soft. If you grade it to a certain level, then you may call it intelligence as well. So in terms of capacity and capability, you need both hard and soft elements of this capacity and capability. Then we need to be able to beef up a response mechanism. Why do we need a response mechanism? We need a response mechanism in order to one, deter, two, disrupt certain times, three, contain certain times, certain times you may just need to contain the crime or the, the, the maritime threat, and then finally to interdict. So what capability helps us to do in terms of hard and soft capability and capacity is for us to be able to detect, disrupt, contain, and interdict. And this is very crucial because almost every time as laid out by IFE, there will be people that want to um, um, threaten the security of the ocean space, either in terms of transnational organized crime, individual actors, economic related crimes. So we need to be able to continuously disrupt, but we need to be able to detect what is happening before we can disrupt. And when it is necessary to contain it or to make sure that you have been able to interdict it. And once there is interdiction, then a certain consequence will flow. And the consequence that will flow generally is to make sure that you investigate, collect evidence, and then prosecute. 
so that you can further detect and make sure that you secure the ocean space. So in, the, in that respect also, we need prosecutorial capacity. And here once more, it is in the soft and hard. Uh, the soft elements is to make sure that you have the requisite legal framework in place. Detecting crime is difficult, but prosecuting crime is much more difficult. And if you look at maritime crime, maritime crime is multifaceted. And again, you don't have the same way of luxury when you are dealing with land crime as maritime crime. If there were to be a crime on land, it is very possible that beyond the law enforcement officers, there will be many people that would be can call as, 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 as witnesses. They would have seen the crime. They would have seen how the crime play out. And all of them will help in the prosecutorial uh, chain as witnesses. You don't have the same luxury when it comes to maritime crime. So in terms of maritime crime, the ability to get evidence, and here normally you were talking about high level evidence and forensic evidence, for example, is very key, but also electronic evidence. This is something that you need very much when it comes to maritime crime. So you need to be able to have this soft element of the evidence, then you have to be able to have the legal framework in place then you need the capacity to prosecute the crime. And this is where you need training of you know, people that understand crime and can be able to prosecute it. Um, when it comes to uh, a, a regional level, and I'll move a bit to continental level before I come to regional, in terms of continental level, you need a, a whole continental um, consciousness to be able to deal with maritime crime. And here in the African continent, quite a lot has happened Although you may say it is not um, enough, uh, for example, we have had the uh, we have had the Africa Integrated Maritime Strategy. We had the Lomi Charter that was adopted in 2012, and generally, African institutions, be they the African Union itself or the Africa Development Bank, are focusing more and more in the maritime space and creating more awareness. Um, when it comes to um, uh, the, 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 uh, some of the examples, for example, um, you can talk about the national level. You can talk about significant advancement that has taken place in some countries in terms of putting in place um, strategic frameworks. Strategic framework, you can talk about Cote d'Ivoire, for example, uh, that has put in place a, a maritime, uh, an ocean strategy or a maritime security strategy. Uh, you can talk about Nigeria that currently um, it's very much advanced with a national maritime uh, strategy. Then you can talk about Ghana, that is also very advanced with a, a national integrated maritime strategy. When you talk about legal uh, reforms, although the, 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 the region and the continent generally is, is, is still challenged, but you can also talk about significant improvement. For example, you talk about Nigeria, you talk about Togo. Um, that these are countries that have got significant legal framework and some of the examples you can give, for uh, in, uh, for example, in Togo, there was the Dona one uh, case. In Nigeria, there's the Halifing uh, uh, 11 case that has been successfully prosecuted under the Nigerian uh, 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 Act that they have. But I said I wanted to talk about regional because more importantly, when you are talking about maritime security, maritime security is carried on the regional. So regional approach and regional responses are key to addressing maritime security. The fact is that you cannot have a, a whole continental approach to a maritime security response. Uh, you definitely will need something at the east coast of Africa, and you will need something at the west coast of Africa. So regional becomes the, the, the most effective platform that leverage and expand national air force, but that also embark upon continental you know, effort and uh, partnerships to achieve greater effect when it comes to maritime response. So that's the why regional is, is, is key. In terms of the Gulf of Guinea, I want to show two slides. And these two slides um, will explain um, how, uh, and, and, uh, and I'm sure that it is going to be showed uh, by the moderator or somebody. And these two slides will show clearly uh, how Gulf of Guinea states have evolved in terms of an architecture to address you know, maritime security, uh, starting from the, the fact that uh, since 2011, there has been, especially in the area of piracy, there has been significant trust um, in the Gulf of Guinea, and there has been some significant responses. Um, 
I think what I will want to zero on is the fact that in the Gulf of Guinea, the Yaoundé architecture was finally um, uh, negotiated and adopted in 2013. And what the Yaoundé architecture does is to create a legal framework for Gulf of Guinea states to individually but collectively and with the support of international partners address significant issues in maritime security. Um, this Yaoundé architecture is much more reflected in what is called the different levels of response from the ICC through to the, to, to, to the national level. Next slide, please. So if you look at the slide, the next slide that follows, that slide gives you a clear indication of what we have now in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, just not coastal states, but long-lock states as well. You have what we call the Interregional Coordination Center that is in Yaoundé. Then you have two sub-regional coordination centers, CRISMAC, that takes care of the Central African region. Then you have CRISMAO that takes care of the West African region. And under this architecture, under this regional level, you come to the multi-national uh, coordination level where a number of states have been put together in what we call the, multi the multinational maritime coordination centers. You have zone A, D, E, F, and G. And currently zone D, E, and F are very operational, and that is why we have put them in green. Um, in the case of Zone D, for example, you have Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, and South Tome and Principe, and these countries come together to monitor the bigger area of Zone D, and for that matter, also reinforce and communicate with the other zones. Then you have Zone E uh, that puts together Nigeria, Benin, Togo, and importantly, Niger. And this is where the landlord countries play also a significant role, being part of this architecture. Then you have Zone F that puts together Ghana, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and once again, Burkina Faso. Um, zone G and Zone A are not very operational, but these three zones are very much operational on ground. And what they do at three levels, information is shared across. Um, critical intelligence is shared across, and when there is a need for response, the response is coordinated. So this is what is happening in terms of how the architecture is organized. I'll run quickly to, 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 to speak uh, to a few more things to, to finish it. Um, one is um, in terms of, um, despite all this, what, what is happening when, it terms, when we talk about the challenges, but what are the positive things? The challenges will remain, the fact that we have insufficient strategic focus on the continent when it comes to the maritime space. Um, we need to galvanize more in terms of our political leaders to understand the significant and also spend budgetary resources in protecting the maritime space. There is still limited maritime domain awareness, and this has to be, uh, we need to boost that. There is insufficient platforms, although many countries have improved platforms, but we are still having challenges, still having with, having platforms. challenges with platforms. But let me I indicate, indicate that there, there has also been significant that there has also been significant improvement um, when it comes to the Gulf of Guinea. The Yaoundé architecture, and generally in the continent, even in the east coast of Africa as well, the Yaoundé architecture is an example. But many other countries have also had significant improvement in terms of platform, but also in terms of legal framework. We talk, for example, of the deep sea project that Nigeria has landed, has a, a launch um, uh, since last year. We talk about the the, the, the new piracy and, uh, and maritime uh, uh, crime legislation in Nigeria. Uh, we talk about a successful prosecution in Nigeria, successful prosecution in, in, in Togo. And this must be taken seriously because at times the picture is pictured as if we don't have success stories, but there are significant success stories as well. And what we need to do is to build upon that. Uh, finally, um, so what are some of the things that we need to do? Uh, some of the things that we need to do is, for example, to have dedicated funding for maritime uh, ocean governance and maritime security. This is important. Uh, the truth is that there's competing budgets in almost every country, and you don't have the luxury of funding um, uh, coast guards and navies from the normal budget. So we have to look more at having what I call the maritime security fund. Uh, if it has already indicated that we need to have this consciousness of being self-reliant. As much as there is support, and that support is welcome, it is important that um, countries in the West Coast, countries in the East Coast, look more and more to themselves 
And there is a capacity, for example, there's no doubt that there is sufficient capacity in Nigeria, for example, to do beyond policing Nigerian waters and to extend that capacity and capability to other countries in the sub-region. So we have to forge ahead and see how we do that. Just last week, there was a, a high leadership conference in Nigeria led by the Nigerian Navy, and we want to see more of sections that will take things regionally. Uh, there has been the success stories such as um, exercise Obangami um, that has fostered and helped build capacity over the years in the region, but it is important that members of the Gulf of Guinea and other regions do certain things on their own to show that they are capable of standing on their own when it comes to uh, the, uh, when it becomes necessary. And finally, we have to have smart responses. Smart responses will require that uh, we, we keep detecting and, uh, and, and collecting data and information and intelligence on what is happening, be able to profile vessels or, or threats of interest and be able to address them quickly before uh, they, 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 they become something that we can handle. So these are where I will put my thoughts and I very much also look forward to, to, to answering questions and interacting more um, with um, the distinguished audience that we have been speaking to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamal, for your brilliant presentation, which complemented in a very balanced way the previous presentation, especially when you mentioned the importance of maritime security in the creation of infrastructures, infrastructures such as what we mentioned in terms of ships and um, softer infrastructures like uh, information, the information that uh, makes all of this possible. And you talked about the need to build capacities and training. This is a very complex effort, a very vast effort. And above all, as we saw, this is all a very complex effort when the frontiers between one country and another, or when there are international seas that are very diffuse. And we're in the legislation of one country, it doesn't um, mesh with that of another. And you also mentioned the importance of coordination between agencies within countries and between countries. This isn't the case not only in Africa, but in my country, for example, that has a, a vast maritime history. And we know the importance of this kind of coordination. When it doesn't exist, there's many resources that are lost. So we also have to build capacity. As Dr. Kamal said, if uh, countries don't invest in this, the other countries aren't going to help you. So we have to create capacities through information and operations. And you have to go to a regional level after this, after the national level. And this is all very, very vast and complex effort. That's why we have to work through regional, the regional level. Uh, regardless of the crime that's being committed at, on the high seas, uh, the criminal can take refuge in a given country and escape justice. So we need proper prosecutorial efforts to implement our maritime laws. And this was a very strong message that was delivered.